As an astrobiologist, I worry about where else in the universe we might be able to find life and how we should go about searching for it. So I'm very interested in this question of the relationship between life on Earth and the rest of the planet. And one way to think about this is through this strange question, can a planet be alive? In other words, is life something that just happened on Earth, that just happens to a planet? Or is life something that a planet becomes? Is life something that, that happens to a planet? Or is life something that just happens on a planet? I dedicate this to the memory of Lynn Margulis, who died in November, who was a, a friend, a mentor, and an inspiring colleague, a courageous, brilliant woman. Here she is marrying Carl Sagan, and there she is being honored by Bill Clinton. And Lynn contributed a lot of ideas some of which were very controversial when they were introduced, many of which turned out to be right, which changed some of the ways we think about evolution of life on Earth. She challenged, for instance, the notion of strict Darwinian evolution in that she showed that a lot of evolution happens between microorganisms exchanging genes with one another, not simply competing through natural selection, but sharing genes. And also, she pioneered the notion that in addition to competition, radical cooperation is important in evolution. That some very important advances in complexity of, of cells happened from cells living together with different specializations that then became individuals with the benefits of, of all of their, their abilities. So she, she challenged our notion of life on the very small scale. She also challenged our notion of life on the very large scale. And with Jim Lovelock, seen here, in 1974, Lynn proposed the Gaia hypothesis by publishing this really important paper, Atmospheric Homeostasis by and for the Biosphere. Homeostasis meaning self-regulation. You are practicing homeostasis right now. Your body is maintaining its internal temperature and maintaining other things, the pH of your blood and so forth, that help you to stay alive. And the idea was, in this paper and in the Gaia hypothesis, that the totality of life on Earth practices homeostasis, that conditions on Earth are maintained by life in ways that are beneficial for life. And it also involves a radical new way of thinking about evolution, because as opposed to the perhaps traditional Darwinian notion of thinking of changes in the environment, random changes that then life adapts to, the Gaia hypothesis recognized that life also changes the environment in radical ways. And therefore, adaptation goes both ways. It's a feedback between life and the environment. And that changes the way we think about life on Earth. An example they gave of, of the way that life has radically changed one aspect of Earth is if you look at the composition of Earth's atmosphere, seen here in terms of the amount of CO2, nitrogen, oxygen, water, and methane, compared to Venus, Mars, and a dead Earth. The dead Earth, you can model, is very similar to Venus and Mars. It's all CO2 in the atmosphere and almost nothing else. Without life, that's what Earth would be like. But with life, Earth has all this oxygen and some other strange things like methane. Now, oxygen and methane is an interesting pair. They should not exist. It's what we call out of equilibrium. Left to its own devices, the planet, the oxygen and methane would quickly react and the planet would revert to a Venus and Mars-like condition. But it's not left to its own devices. There's some process radically perturbing the atmosphere and that process is life. Now, we can ask, therefore, can a planet really be alive? In order to address that, we have to say what we mean by these terms. I don't want to talk about the definition of a planet. Uh, even though people love to argue about that, and I love to argue about that, but it's really kind of stupid. And let's not waste our time on that right now. But what is life? Historically, that's been a vexing problem for humanity. Or another way to put it, wh what is the essential difference between living matter and non-living matter? Uh, before we had modern scientific knowledge, there were ideas about animistic principles or spiritual principles or something that, that, that sort of um, inhabits a living body that's distinct some nature, some essence that's distinct from a non-living piece of matter. But 
thanks to the insights of organic chemistry and uh, molecular biology and so forth, we now have a pretty good understanding on a mechanical level of how life works and how it is that non-living matter, atoms of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, can organize themselves in such a way as to become living matter. But there's still some paradoxes when we get to the very small and very large scales of life. For instance, a human being is alive. I think on this point we would all agree. What's a human being made out of? It's made out of cells. Are cells alive? Well, yeah, they, they behave like they're alive. They reproduce, they metabolize, and so forth. Cells are made out of molecules. Are molecules alive? Well, maybe some of them are. This DNA molecule can reproduce itself, can, can copy itself. So is it alive? Well, it can't do that outside of the structure of living cells. And then that leads to paradoxes, for instance, like that of a virus. A virus has DNA or RNA. It can replicate itself, but only by hijacking the machinery of another cell by itself a virus isn't alive. So then some people say virus is not life. But you can go back up the chain and say the same thing about a human being. Can a human being exist without other living systems? If you took a naked human, put him on the moon, how long are they going to stay alive? So in a sense, then if you say a virus isn't alive, for that reason you have to say people are. There's just some funny paradoxes that you get to when you look at what is life on the small scale. On the large scale, what about assemblages of organisms? Are they also alive? Well, look at this ecosystem, this lake ecosystem. These trees used to be alive. Now they're sort of dead, and yet they're essential habitats for the rest of the ecosystem, and they're decaying and creating nutrients for the rest of the ecosystem. So in a sense, even the, quote, dead parts are part of the larger life. This coral reef, a tiny percentage of it is made of living cells, and yet the, what's left behind by the action of those living cells creates the habitat without which there could be no life, and in fact, remakes radically the entire landscape. So in this landscape, the, the breakdown between what's strictly alive and what's strictly not alive is, is a little bit fuzzy. And in some ways, with the Gaia hypothesis, you can extend that principle to the entire biosphere of the Earth. Is the planet alive? Well, what is life? We, we look at things and we, we know. This kitten's alive. This rock is not alive, right? But interestingly, this rock is full of cryptoendolithic bacteria, which means bacteria that can hide inside of rocks. And this cat is made out of important components of it. Some of the most kittenish components, like the fur and the claws, are not made out of living cells. So let's be a little careful here. Now look at these two planets. This one looks pretty dead. This one has some other kinds of qualities. Can a planet be alive? Well, isn't a planet basically just a rock? And a rock can contain life, can be a habitat for life, but can it in itself be alive? Well, what if you take a rock and make it larger and larger and larger? Start with something fist size and end up with something earth size. Then it goes from looking like this, at least sometimes, to looking like this. What's going on? Why does a planet, why does a rock, when it come, becomes the size of, the, of a planet, take on living qualities? Well, if you make a rock large enough, it takes on behavior that is conducive to life, if not even, in a certain sense, somewhat alive or resembling life. An object large enough will become hot inside. It's just basic physics. And when it becomes hot, it starts to convect. And that convection leads to the overturning and renewal of the crust and the renewal of the atmosphere and all these processes we think of when we think about um, the Earth system science and plate tectonics. A large enough rock will also gather an atmosphere. It has to. Again, basic physics, gravity. And an atmosphere on a planet like the Earth, again, takes on this cycling, overturning, moving quality and so we have these two great heat engines in the interior and the exterior of the Earth. And indeed, any rock that gets large enough will have those two great heat engines. And we, here on the surface of the Earth, take advantage of the interface between those two. So you have sunlight driving all kinds of cyclic overturns. It's good for life. And you have internal activity of the Earth, volcanoes and so forth, um, driving. Again, it's the combination of all this that keeps the nutrients fresh, keeps the landscape renewed, keeps niches um, happening that, that are, make the Earth so conducive for life. So a rock that's large enough will behave this way, will be conducive to life, and in some ways will sort of seem alive itself. Now, when we think about looking for life on other planets, we think about things like looking for water on Mars. There it is, water on Mars. We found it. Yay. But most of the evidence for water on Mars is in the deep past. It's very exciting, but it's sort of forensic biology, looking at uh, uh, an environment that was conducive to life in the past, but isn't for the most part today. The thing that we see on Mars today that is the most lifelike, and in some ways to me the most exciting and enchanted feeling, are these dust devils that course across 
the desert on hot summer afternoons and draw these great doodles in, on the surface that change over time. So there's something that's changing and moving, and it seems alive. It feels alive. And this harkens back, in a way, to, to a view that, that people on the Earth in many societies, many pre-scientific societies had, that move, movements in nature seem alive. And so we have spirits and gods and, and ideas about creatures involved in storms and clouds and the motion of water. Well, you can regard that, if you want, as a, as a sort of primitive thought, but I actually regard it as a valid insight that's very important because these dust devils are an example of a kind of physical phenomena that in a way is sort of alive, or at least is very important in understanding what life is in the universe. It's something we call a dissipative structure, which comes out of, uh, out of thermodynamics. And the dissipative structure, these are examples of dissipative structures, and they're basically the kinds of structures that result when you have a flow of matter and energy that allows the existence of a stable form. And so we have dust devils and whirlpools and storms. These are actually on Venus. And standing waves. There's some ways in which life is a complex dissipative structure. Life is like a standing wave. What do I mean by that? Well, what are you? Are you the atoms you're made out of? If so, then you're not the same as you were a year ago and you will be in the future because we eat, we poop, we breathe in, we breathe out. Our atoms are constantly changing and yet we remain in the way that a standing wave, the water is passing through, but the structure persists. That's what a dissipative structure is. It exists when there's the right kind of flow of energy and matter. And in some ways, you can regard the biosphere of Earth as the most complex dissipative structure we know, driven by the energy of sunlight. So, as we go out in the universe and look at other planets and try to understand whether or not they might have life, and it's a great time to do that, of course, right now, because we're discovering all these planets around other stars. It's a, it's, it's a revolution right now in, in the number of planets we know about and we're starting to learn about. But how do we tell if they might have life? What do we look for? Well, Spock has a tricorder. If I had a tricorder, my job as an astrobiologist would be much simpler. I could point it at a planet and go, it's dead, Jim, or it's alive, Jim. But unfortunately, I don't have that. And so I have to try to gain all the insights I can from the nature of life on Earth and what we know about other planetary environments. Oh, there's Pluto wants to be part of the picture. Get out of there, Pluto. Anyways, oh, cut it out. Um, the reason why I think this is important is because it's very hard not to be self-referential when we ask this question and just be so caught up in the noise of our own views about ourselves that we miss something from another planet. So in conclusion, can a planet be alive? I think maybe. And I think it's a very useful way for us to think about life as we proceed into the rest of the universe. Thank you.